Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. We are here with myself, Evan. Uh, we also have Dan and John. And today we're going to be covering some Modern Horizons 2 auxiliary characters that have now become main characters. Yeah, Modern Horizons 2 gave us so many just interesting characters to build around. Uh, we touched on a lot of them inadvertently through the Dak and Blackblade episode, but there's a bunch of other really cool ones that have pretty short blurbs, so... This one might not be a super long episode, but we just kind of want to go over the small blips of these characters. Yeah, and I think we're going to be starting here with the five-color man himself, Garth One-Eye. Um, Garth was originally known as Galen. That's what he was born as. He's the son of Cullinarn. Uh, Cullinarn was the master of the green-blue house of Ortel. The house was uh, destroyed by Cthulhuman, who was the Grand Master of the Arena of Estark, who was on a quest to become a planeswalker. Aren't Garth we was all? five years old at the time. What did you say? I said, aren't we all? <laughs> God, I wish. <laughs> uh, Garth was uh, five years old at the time of the event, and uh, it would be known as the Night of Fire. And Zarel, the servant of Cthulhuman, gouged his left eye out to torment his father. Imagine being five years old and losing your eye. That's pretty intense. Yeah. No, that's a setup to be a main character, man. That is also that is very true. Look at him. That and that art. Uh Garth ran back into the burning house and Zero believed he was dead. After twenty years in exile, a motorcycle's gonna pass my house really loudly. Um <laughs> after twenty years in exile, he returned to Estark under the false name of Garth and manipulated the remaining houses and the new grandmaster, uh Zarl, so he could win the tournament and meet Cthulhuman in what would then be known as the Time of Troubles. During his fights in the arena, he became known to the mob as Garth One-Eye. Garth was uh, successful in, de in defeating Cthulhuman, thank God, and even managed uh, to somehow use a spell to steal the ability to walk the planes. I gotta, Later, he willing I gotta jump in here. I, I was clicking the link while you were on here. The Time of Troubles, it just says the Time of Troubles happened in 4069 AR. It was a short period of time when Garth One-Eye arrived in Estark during the 998th Festival Games to avenge the death of his father, Cullinard. Uh, and the destruction of House Ortail. Garth's action caused great chaos and destruction of vast areas of Astark and cost the lives of thousands of its citizens. So Garth Seems really just kind of popped in there and messed stuff up. Yeah, we, uh, like yeah, I said, man. at one point, one of these characters would be good. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, please I mean, carry on, though, yeah. Of course. So um, later, he willingly gave up his planeswalking ability so he could live with the uh, Benelish woman known at the time as Noreen whom he had met during his adventure. These two retired in the countryside of Gish with their child Hammond, little well, ham boy, to uh, grow a vineyard. However, Garth found leaving behind his powers much harder than he thought because his powers were really cool and started journeying between the plains again. It was during one of his absences that Noreen and ham boy were kidnapped and brought to Benalia. So murder, rebel, deadbeat dad. Yeah, so yeah. well, I wouldn't think deadbeat dad. He's got, he, he tried. He was just out for cigarettes. <laughs> he's playing fun for some cigarettes and milk. He knows his addiction to power over his family. I, it's not. It, it, they're really cool powers, John. They are. He's got all five colors of mana. Saying he's Would wrong, you want to hang out at home? I entirely feels pain. But um, after the death of uh, Sabram and the rescue of Noreen and Hammond, Garth started a fight with Gull and the Green Sleeves, which sounds like um, like a Disney gang. I was gonna sound, and, say it uh, sounds like a hipster band. We're gonna go see Gull and the Green Sleeves later. Yeah, down at by the by the by the pier. Yeah. <laughs> um, Garth thought that they were the kidnappers. However, the green sleeves quickly brought the wizard to his senses when they uh, confronted by when they were confronted by Noreen on his negligence for family duty. Garth admitted the wrongness of his ways and how he really kind of messed up by missing his powers and going back to using them. So he gave up his spell satchel, did the green sleeves, and promised he would never abandon his family anymore, like a good boy. And then Redemption. he offered, "What's up? Redemption." Right? A little redemption arc for him. Uh, he then offered his knowledge of Dominaria, gathered during his wanderings, in order to bring the people from Greensleeve's army to their homelands. Then he and his family returned to their vineyard, offering their help if the Greensleeves requested it. Just kind of like uh, little mini mini Avengers, almost. Hmm. But, Who are the Greensleeves? Know, I want to quickly know about them. Oh, yeah. Greensleeves was an archdruid during modern times on Dominaria and briefly a planeswalker. She was a slender woman with long blonde hair. Oh, it was an actual person named Greensleeve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought. Archdruid. 
Yeah, during her youth, Greensleeves lived peacefully with her brothers Gull and Sparrowhawk in the village of White Ridge on the border of the Whispering Woods. She was perceived to be dim-witted <laughs> because she couldn't talk, but only chattered in animal sounds to communicate simple emotions like fear, hunger, interest, etc. One day, a falling star was seen in the sky, which was reputed to be a bad omen. This was proven true when the White Ridge was destroyed during a wizard's duel. The elders and children all died, and among... Everyone seems to die in the magic story. The elder, sorry, the old ones. Yeah, the elders and children all died, and almost all remaining villagers decided to relocate elsewhere. One of the dueling wizards, Towser, came to Gull, and after assuring him he had no part in the destruction of the village, asked to become the new freight master. Gull, confused by the mind magic of Towser and with nowhere else to go, accepted uh, his offer and brought green sleeves along. Hmm. Very Tim witted. I think I subconsciously put the in front of green, green sleeves when I was reading it back on the on the Garth page there. It's a possibility. Yeah, I, <laughs> we should actually go into green sleeves at one point. Green sleeves is a way bigger story than Garth, but yeah, we'll go back to Garth now. Yeah, getting back into Garth here um, after covering the green sleeves, uh, going into how Garth looked, he was very uh, very sh- not like not short but average height, uh, skinny boy. With a bony face. I don't know why I keep saying boy. He was a, he was a grown adult man at this point. He's a wee boy. Um, He's a wee lad. <laughs> little Garthy boy. But um, he, was a, he was a very thin man. Um, very bony face. Cheekbones protruding out. Uh, bronzed by the sun because he was working out in the vineyard. And he had a scruffy dark hair with a messy cut. Usually dressed in black and he wore a spell satchel at his belt. Um, in Noreen's opinion, Garth resembled a scarecrow. Very, very loving opinion of his wife. Yeah, no wonder he was out for cigarettes. <laughs> also, the only, Garth, yeah, well, yeah, Garth resembled a scarecrow. His only arresting features were his eyes, turquoise blue. The lost eye, in fact, grew back thanks to his ascension, leaving a white uh, white scar star around it. I'm going to be honest. I can't go by Daniel one arm if I have both arms. What are we talking about? I mean, maybe he just wore an eye patch over it. You know, it's just uh, like like I can't be like... You can't be like seven foot tall, John, if you're not seven feet tall. You can't just give yourself this nickname. I feel I mean, like if you look at his art, he's only got one eye. Well, no, yeah, canonically, like he has two eyes. You were back. No, but one of them's golden. Yeah, but that's just the cool eye. But that's eye. still two eyes. It's not <sighs> Garth one, not gold eye. Garth two eyes. Uh, just naming characters on, two, on just totally normal things. <laughs> Garth and black hair. This is Evan two hands. All right. Little do you know, Dan. I have three. Burr, burr, burr. Yeah, no. So um, Garth appeared in the pre revisionist books. Uh, there was no mention of Planeswalker Sparks. Any mage could break a Plains Veil with the right spells in sufficient mana. To make the pre revisionist books fit revisionist continuity, many people believe that the wizards who became Planeswalkers by spells actually possessed sparks that were flared by the spells they cast, but didn't know that these sparks were like their Planeswalker thing. However, Garth might be an, uh, an exception to this theory. The novel Arena states that the spell researched by Carolyn could grant the planeswalking power to anyone casting it. It's not likely, though, that Carolyn created a real spark with her spell because even planeswalkers don't understand its nature fully. The explanation of this might just be that the spell simulated the powers of a spark to some extent. Uh, in 2021, it was stated in a retcon that Garth's planeswalker spark ignited the moment he won vengeance against the killer of his kin. Boo. No. Ooh. Ooh. He, no. um, Come on. So, It'd be so much better if he wasn't a planeswalker. Yeah. They they really gotta get that stuff together. The uh he having five color mana also is a really interesting thing because he was born of like a blue green kind of guild, but he was able to use a bunch. I'll let I'll let you guys go through some of the spells he was able to cast in the colors. Yeah, John, um, you wanna go on those? War Mammoths, Land of War Elves. He cast Fog, Iron Root Tree Folk, Wall of Wood, Wall of Brambles, Giant Growth, Giant Spider, and he didn't have regeneration to fix his eye. Um, His white mana, he had Circles of Protection, he summoned a White Knight, Healing Solve, which could have fixed his eye, Reverse Damage, which could have fixed his eye, Armageddon. Oh, he's a DJ. um, Blue mana, he had Flash Fleas, Psionic Blasts, he has Invisibility, um, counter spells and levitation. For his black mana, he'd use Terror, Relentless Rats. I hate that card. <laughs> um, Manor Skeleton, Infernal Medusa, a Lich. He also summoned a Lich to fight Goal. And his red mana was just Fireball, Wall of Stone, and yeah, Ace. 
Arathi Berserker. Arathi, yeah. Arathi Berserker. And he had a Juggernaut and a Disrupting Scepter for artifacts. Sounds like he was really playing jank, to be honest. Pretty much, yeah. That's, there's no synergy in that. He cast in healing salve? You should have gone blue, my man. <laughs> the boon cycle is not even. I'll say that right now. <laughs> um, the next one of the main characters in the story is it still just blows my mind that anyone has ever been able to pronounce this name i'm gonna try again right now but i don't believe my attention span can it's as morano mardike di satina it's as more uh, john you take a run at it i think yeah you're right. as mora nomadic it's so you say it like nomadic so nomadic Ah, it's a short A sound. There's no E to make it a long A. So, as as Mora, nomadic, a diced in a kulda car. I'm gonna take your word for that. I want to know what her parents' names are. Yeah, that's what you name a child you don't like. (laughs) Yeah, that's why she's red. It's Dominaria. (laughs) Everything's Dominaria, to be honest. That's a great plane. Um, Asmore, for short, was a female wizard and a great cook from Dominaria. Uh, she once summoned a lord of the pit named Vincent for a duel, but ran out of stuff to feed it. She escaped being eaten by entering into his service as a chef for seven years and seven days. She offered to feed him a new dish every single day as long as he didn't eat her. Vincent agreed, but only on the condition that if he ever became bored with her dishes, he'd have her for the next meal. Wait, who's Vincent? Pretty, pretty good cook. Uh, one oh, of the lord good. of the pits, yeah. Imagine being like a super powerful demon, but your name's Vincent. Yeah. All hail Vincent. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know how I got here. <laughs> Vincent would have to be British. Uh, Asmore managed, managed to surprise Vincent with every dish that she prepared, and near the end of her service, he became wistful and offered her a full-time job cooking for him without a threat of death. She just wanted to get out of hell, so Vincent asked her to collect her recipes for him for when she left. She agreed, but only if she could make copies to sell in the overworld. About 20 copies of the Underworld cookbook were made, but only two were sold in five months. One to Vincent and one to her mother. And I pulled four of them from Modern Horizons (laughs) 2. I'll let you guys go on with the rest of this one here. Yeah, so she was so embarrassed and disgusted with the failure of her cookbook, Asmore told her imps to incinerate the rest of them. So, But then they just got lazy on their way to the furnace and tossed the books into the overworld. And the books were found. People started trying to put the, together her recipes, and they just ended up be, being the rage of the high courts. A lot of ogres, goblins, throat wolves, and other creatures she had described as delicious were now hunted in, as ingredients. This meant that they had a huge grudge against Asmore and tried to track her down to kill her as soon as she got free. She decided to write a second volume to the cookbook to get the monsters off her back with entries like A Thousand and One Ways to Prepare Elf and a number of other dishes aimed at serving the upper class, including methods of preparing goblin princes, dwarven counselors, and elven aristocrats. Okay, wait. Oh. So the human aristocrats of Dominaria were eating dwarves, goblins, elves. What? This is a dark story. Asmore's not even a good character. What? What? Yeah. A thousand and one ways to prepare elves. I mean, look at some of the recipes in the cookbook. Honey-baked breast of granite gargoyle. Sautéed beevil? Cute pegasus. Cute pegasus in red sauce with dragonfly garnish. Gray ogre toes and sweet black sauce. Yummy. Barbecued throat wolf ribs. Atog pate on honey-soaked ironroot bark. I'm not going to lie, the barbecued... uh, Barbecue throw wolf ribs really got my mouth watering. I could go for some barbecue throw wolf ribs. I get it. Honestly. Basilisk eye in, I don't know how to say that word. Jasconia sauce? Jasconia sauce? Jasconia sauce. I'm not cultured Mm. enough. I wonder wonder what Jasconia Jasconia sauce is. Cute Pegasus sounds pretty not good as like a good guy thing. I don't think it sounds good in general. I mean, I think you get cursed if you eat Pegasus. Maybe that's the maybe that's the chase. Although I'm saying it's it does sound like a good hell cookbook. The other okay, so cookbook was a pretty cool card uh, for anyone who plays. Is a creature. Yeah, uh, for anyone who plays Magic, who I assume if you're listening to this, you do. Just the mm-hmm. the ability to discard a card, create a food token, and then sack it, return target creature from your graveyard to your hand. That's a great card. 
pretty pretty good. Okay, okay. So Jasconius is an island fish. Okay. So it's a fish sauce. Basilisk guy and a fish sauce. That doesn't sound horrible. Sauteed beebles. What are beebles? No, bouncing beebles? A creature Where type describing a, a magical construct similar to a homunculus, which is used by researchers <laughs> of the Tolarian Academy as a convenient, easily summoned demonstration. So just just a test subject Hold thing. Hold on, Dan. I'm sending you the card that they're in right now. Oh, Bear is that the, from the unset, the beeble? No, um, from uh, what you call it, uh, Urza Saga. It's called Bouncing Beebles. Bouncing Let me... Beebles. On paste, paste, damn it. Control V, upload. Let me, there we go. Take a look. Pretty Bouncing good card. Beebles. I, think, I think there's a Beeble in Modern Horizons 2. Is there? Yeah, it looks something that looks like one. Unsanctioned had uh, Planeswalker Bob and a Beeble token. <laughs> Bob. Uh, Mark. Uh, yeah, sorry. Mark Rosewater stated the Beebles were only to be seen in supplemental products in the future. Aww. They're on several other cards, including Donate, Wizard Mentor, um, and the Exodus version of Nausea. Oh, that's cool. Looking at their artwork. And they're in Topsy Turvey, Saute, and the flavor text of Fraction Jackson. And now they're a dish. Oh, and they're in Equilibrium, too. I didn't know that. I played Equilibrium today. What a great card. Hey, is that the... Whenever you successfully cast a creature spell, you can pay one to return target creature to its owner's hand. Yeah. I have the one that has the water wheel on the art. Bursting Beebles claims that Beebles quit magic for several years following the the release of the Mercadian mask set. (laughs) It is interesting how they tie so many of these weird things together. Right? I'm kind of disappointed that some of the sauce wasn't like an actual thing. Yeah, I think the Atog pate is hilarious because I love the Atogs. <laughs> Yummy. And there's Sounds only, French. There's only 12 cards of them. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, so she was depicted in the Kitchen Imp uh, or quoted or referred to in Kitchen Imp, Discerning Taste, Chef's Kiss. Actually, really good artwork for all of her stuff. Yeah, they really knocked the artwork out of the park with Modern Horizons 2. <laughs> I like it all. The uh, the flavor text on Discerning Taste is everyone loves a dash of crushed pixie, except the pixie. <laughs> I mean, you, I, I bet if you didn't tell the pixie, they'd like it too. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a big fan of that one. Uh, we had another reprint in the set, and it was Chainer. Chainer was first in one of the Commander decks, and is actually a really, really good card for commander i i I think it makes a really cool deck in general discard outlet lets you cast creatures from the graveyard i like it but chainer was a pit fighter and a dementia caster for the cabal under master skellum as a cabalist the name chainer was a nickname while his real secret name was mazura chainer was the first person to have found the mirari on dominaria initially he was able to resist its lure but ultimately he became obsessed with it and was consumed by its power what's the secret name Who's he, who does he tell the secret name to? Is it, does he just whisper it to himself? I don't know. What's... Oh, I mean, I guess Chainer as a nickname, but, like, I don't know why they have secret in parent. Like, it, it doesn't feel like a secret name. It just feels like his real name. Hmm. Uh, Chainer was born in a small uh, village in the Salt Flats in the outskirts of the Cabal City. Little is known about his origin, but it is known that it was there that he picked up the Phobia of Snakes, which would become his dementia summoning trademark. He also learned how to use the weapon that would be his namesake, the chain. Chainer was taught how to pit fight by an old, mostly blind dementia caster named Minette, who suggested the chain weapon as it was unusual and thus would appeal to the crowds and would also be powerful at range. He showed Chainer how to wield the weapon and how to use magic to enhance it, such as creating weights or spikes on the end to injure opponents and creating new links in the chain to allow Chainer to call her enemies. With time, Chainer learned how to create these chains solely through magic rather than needing a real chain. Manat also taught him the powerful Death Bloom spell, which Chainer would come to use on several occasions to slay superior opponents. Ooh, sounds like a good video game. Yeah, to be honest, Chainer's actually a pretty interesting sounding character. As Chainer's pit fighting, pit fighting improved, he moved to the Cabal City itself to be trained as a true dementia caster. He was placed under the care of another senior dementia master, Skellum. The two bonded well with Skellum taking on a partial role while teaching Chainer the art of dementia casting. Chainer showed such promise that Skellum hoped that Chainer would become a true master of dementia rather than just another pit fighter. One day during his early training, Chainer had a chance, uh, Chainer had by chance been exploring the old part of the city for fun when he felt strangely drawn to an old ruined manor. 
he descended into its basement and happened upon the Mirari, which showed him visions of his own greatness. Chena resisted the call, descending, deciding that such power would only fit the first of the Cabal. That's a loyal person. Uh, as he traveled, right? yeah, as he traveled to the Patriarch's palace in order to deliver his fine in person, Chena was confronted by order guardsmen, including Major Taro and Officer Banakis, who were inspecting people entering the city that they suspected were in possession of dangerous artifacts. Chainer fought them off before fleeing to the safety of a cabal bar and contacting Skellum, who rescued him and had taken him before the Patriarch to present himself. Luckily, the risks Chainer had taken had paid off as the value of Chainer's find and loyalty he had displayed in taking it to the Patriarch rather than keeping it for himself earned the first favor. Whew. That really, really sounds like either a good movie or a good video game. The artwork on Chainer is really good for both of the cards as well. I'm going to let you... Um, do you want to take this next part, John, when the caster? All right. Chainer then spent most of his time training with Skellum, who showed him how to enter into the dem- dementia space and control the creatures there. However, Skellum's training p- program was interrupted at the beginning of the three-day lunar games, in which the Mirari would be offered as one of the prizes. The Patriarch Command commanded Chainer to accompany one of the top comp- Competitors, the mountain warrior Kamal, and show him how to enter the tournament. Initially, Chainer was unhappy with the assignment, but he soon befriended the barbarian as the two taught each other of their own ways. However, Chainer's assignment was interrupted by a dragon attack on the city. As Kamal ran to aid in the defense, Chainer's mind went to the Mirari. He rushed to the vaults to protect it from any opportunistic looters. There he fought against a group of order troopers who killed his two fellow Kabbalists, including his friend Deidre. In order to defeat the soldiers and their limestone golem, Chainer tapped into the ambient power of the Mirari and unleashed the Death Bloom spell. That's too bad it's not an actual spell. Shattering the golem and killing the order troops. In the aftermath of the attack, the Mirari was given to Lieutenant Kurtar. Kurtar. Chainer protested about simply giving up such a treasure, but the Patriarch assumed him that the orb assured him that the orb oh, oh. would soon return to the Cabal as all valuables eventually did. As Kamal had left the city to chase the Mirari, Chainer resumed his dementia training. Under Skellum's tutelage, he learned how to control the powers in his mind and, transpo- and transpose them into reality, attaining the rank of caster. After this, Chainer then returned to the pits to, to gain experience as at casting under fight conditions. There he fought against Kamal's sister, Jessica, and mentor, Balthor. Hey, hey Jessica which means Kamal. What, who's Kamal? Kamal is the he's a card, barbarian. Right? Yeah, he was, he's got a red card and then also a two green cards. Okay. Kamal Pitfighter okay. is red, and then uh, he just got another oh. one in Commander Legends, and then he had uh, another overrunny kind of card. Kamal's a great character. Yeah. Anyway, like so after he fought Jessica and Balthor, he lost his, was hit by Jessica's explosive bolts. He recovered, though, and receiving an ex- Expensive artificial golem arm, which was paid for by Skellum. Otherwise, his return to the pits was successful due to a skillful blend of melee fighting and, and adept summoning. After some time, the Patriarch's prediction about the Mirari proved true. The Chainer, Chainer witnessed its return to the Cabal in the hands of Braids, following its catastrophic use by order of the Emperor Abushan at this point. Okay, who's Emperor Abushan? Let me take a look. What did he do? Oh, Abishon um, was the Cephalid oh, he's Emperor. Emperor. He's a Mur. Oh, geez. This is oh, the awesome. Cephalid Emperor. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Oh, wow. This guy doesn't look like good business. Yeah, Abishan's awesome. Abishan, Cephalid Emperor, tap and untap Cephalid you control, tap target permanent, three blue, tap all creatures out flying. A very fun card. Oh, man. He made a, he made a deal with someone shady and it replaced the Royal Murfolk family and, take, and took their magical powers. We've all been there. <laughs> Uh, at this point, Chainer was also reunited with Kamal, who had been following the Mirari's journey across Oteria. The two formed a pit-fighting partnership that scored a record-breaking run of 12 consecutive victories, but was broken when the first ordered them to throw their next match. This Aww. went against Kamal's sense of honor and fair play, so he refused to fight and broke off their partnership, although the two still remained friends outside of the pits. I wonder why they'd ask him to throw the fight. Probably because he was fixing it. They had a really good hot streak, so we probably bet on them losing. Yeah. Oh, to be honest, a bunch of money. reading about stuff like this, like I, I knew Chainer was a good reprint because it's just a fun thing, but knowing the background of it, it does make me want to build the card. Like I, I do kind of want to build a Chainer deck now. Build a okay, fighting deck? Oh, Why yeah. is Chainer the best character like in terms of alignment? That yeah. we've read today? Yeah, why, why is the Rakdos yeah. resummon the Dementist? 
<laughs> that's pretty bad. It's it's better than every character we've covered. <laughs> uh, eventually, it was decided that Chainer had enough experience to re- reach the rank of Dementist. Skellum arranged for Chainer and himself to go to the Sikar Rite of Passage, where a caster would travel into Krosa to discover new inspiration for Dementia Beasts. However, the Patriarch felt that Skellum was holding back now that uh, holding back Chainer's progress, and so arranged for the old master to die in a pit fight against an Order Crusader uh, Crusade squad led by Major Taro. The plan almost worked perfectly, but Skellum managed to channel his experience in the fight into Chainer so he could bear witness to the Patriarch's betrayal. Chainer was horrified by it and swore revenge against the squad. However, he still went ahead with Sikar, uh, taking Kamal with him instead. The ritual went smoothly as Chainer captured, as Chainer captured, amongst other things, a wolf monkey and a Grenadin Grendelkin, that's a weird word, in memory of Skellum. Grendelkin. Uh, he also saw a vision of the Cabal's god Kuber, which he took as a sign of passing the trials. So he and Kamal journeyed back to the Cabal city and try the he and Kamal journeyed back to the Cabal city of triumph <laughs> Oof, they are they are going wild with these words as oh, they returned cabal. yeah as they returned kamal and chaner were surprised to find cabal city was under attack by the order they immediately joined the battle where chaner demonstrated his newfound prowess by filling the central arena with dementia beasts that slaughtered the invaders in there with those losses the orders broke off their attack and fled the city however chaner could not take much satisfaction as Kamal had been seriously injured in the battle. The Patriarch was most grateful for Chainer's intervention and granted him the right to use the Mirari. However, Chainer wanted to use it twice, once to heal Kamal and once to fulfill an agreement with Ambassador Laquitus to create a new champion for the Merfolk. In order to do both, the Patriarch insisted that he get revenge upon the Order, co- Order's commanding officer for the attack. This happened to be none other than Major Taro. So Chainer carried out his assignment with, with, with relish, slaughtering Taro, his command corpse, and all... Eh, he's not that good anymore. Uh, and all injured troops recovering in a Samite hospital, and most of the innocent healers there as well. Okay. All My right. previous statement all right. has there, just... Yeah, there's the magic story we know. I, uh, I would have used mustard. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> upon his return, the Patriarch was true to his word and gave the Mirari to Chainer, who then successfully used it to, ca- uh, to create Burke, for Laquitus and also healed Kamal by magically grafting snake skin over his wounds. Laquitus Ooh. was perfectly satisfied with Chainer's creation, but unfortunately, Kamal reacted badly to Chainer's gift. According to his barbarian culture, an injured fighter should recover naturally and learn to fight with whatever he had lost. Kamal chose to burn off his own skin and be rid of the additions rather than become an outcast in his culture. His refusal no, to accept the Kamal's gifts ruined his and Chainer's friendship. Ah. We should do Kamal next week, to be honest. He sounds pretty cool. Kamal and Jessica. All right. Yeah, that's. I'm going to write that down. Someone take the rest <laughs> while I start writing. Yeah, following his uh, successful uses of the Mirari, Chainer became increasingly important to the Cabal and worked closely with the Patriarch. The first had been impressed with Burke and requested that Chainer make a second one as to uh, serve as the first bodyguard. However, this time Chainer decided to use the Mirari to get revenge on the last remaining person responsible for Skellum's death. The Patriarch himself. He had uh, made a deal with La- uh, Laquatus to research the, Patri- the Patriarch's own secret name so that Chainer could weaken him. And then he used uh, the orb to power an enormous death bloom that killed all the Patriarch's bodyguards and attendants. So I guess that's what the secret name's for. It's like a, like a power word. Um, however, the Patriarch himself was immune to the spell due to his pact with Cuber, uh, which made him nigh immortal. Instead, Chainer had to settle with forcing him into exile in a Fedo. Uh, with the Patriarch removed and Chainer in possession of the Mirari, he took control of Cabal City and therefore fulfilled the Mirari's village, uh, visions. So, um, Chainer's, Chainer's big man in charge now. I like it. Yeah, Chainer, right? Chainer's uh, swinging the torch, or the crown. Yeah, yeah right? Um, Chainer's reign was a brief one, though. He uh, presided over the Mirari Games, but those descended into chaos when an order Justicar and three angels appeared during the opening ceremony and tried to take revenge for the murder of Taro and the Samites. Uh, Chainer became infuriated at the chaos and idiocy that surrounded him and decided to rebuild the Cabal as he saw fit. He poured uh, his power into the Mirari to tap into the dementia space of almost every other dementia caster on Otaria and brought all the creatures he found there into existence inside Cabal City, which definitely didn't add to the chaos. Hmm. Um, Carnage ensued until Chainer was confronted by Kamal, who had tried to convince him to stop using the Mirari. The two former friends fought, with Chainer easily besting the still-injured barbarian. 
However, Kamal uh, still managed to melt Chainer's artificial arm off, which caused Chainer to try to heal himself with the Mirari, as he had done with Kamal. The spell went horribly wrong, though, uh, with his first arm becoming that of an insect, and then a fleshy lump. Becoming bored with it, with it all, he attempted to reassor, reabsorb all the creatures he had created with the Mirari into his body, but the Mirari's power finally overwhelmed him, replacing Chainer's entire body with a writhing mass of dementia creatures. The instability and pain of this form were far too much, and he gurgled, presumably, for Kamal to kill him, who did so. Afterward, all of the horrors he had uh, released disappeared back into their owner's minds, while the uh, Mirari now passed on to Kamal. Alright. That's pretty, sad. That was pretty heavy intense. metal. Yeah. yeah. So Chainer is on Chainer's Edict and Chainer's Torment as well, and then has a bunch of actually pretty cool quotes. Chainer D- Chainer's Edict is a phenomenal card. Yeah, waste away as Chainer's Insanity touched nearly every living thing, including viruses. They should make a Death Bloom card. Should. They should. Lockwood well, is his like, champion. What What's the card from Where the Spark? That's one second. This is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Lockwood is his champion. I've never seen this card. It's four double black, oh, uh, six three horror. Burke. When it enters, target player loses oh, six yeah. life. When it leaves, that player gains six life. Pay one to regenerate it, and it's Chainer's Dark Gift to a Darker Soul. Happy birthday to you, Dark Soul. Insidious Dreams, Chainer Dreams of Ultimate Knowledge. Cast Cast Down. down. Yeah, ooh, that's actually a good card. Uh, Your life is finished, your name lost, and your work forgotten. It's as though Mezura never existed. Chainer's Torment. Oof. Oof. Insidious Dreams. That's another good one. Additional cost, uh, pay uh, or discard X cards. Search your library for X cards. And shuffle your library and put those cards on top of it in any order. Great card. Budget, tutor. This is actually uh, reading Chainer. I actually didn't think it was going to be that interesting. I, I thought we were just going to go over it, but I'm going to build this as a deck. Like, this is a, a fun theme. I have the Dementia Master chilling somewhere. Is that the black one? Like, yeah, it's the mono black one. Pay three life. Uh, put target creature card from a graveyard into play under control. It is a nightmare in addition to its other types. When Chainer leaves play, remove all nightmares from the game. Nightmare Adept and Dementia Master. The, yeah, the Nightmare Adept is a really good card. The discard a card, you may cast a creature spell from your graveyard this turn. Activate only once each turn. Whenever a non-token creature enters under your control, if you didn't cast it from your hand, it gains haste till your next turn. Are you Money. telling me that Jund just got two really good cards? Uh, Noble Hierarch and Chainer? Yeah, to be honest, this is a great card to get back. Discard and you can cast I... from the grave. That's... Not only getting good cards into the grave, but being able to bring things back. Ambassador Lackwood I mean, kind of seems killing like killing a Tormagoyth once is hard enough, but killing it twice is. That really flew under the radar in terms of uh, spoilers for me, though. What Chainer? Yeah, I did not know that was in Modern Horizons two until you uh, you had posted about that. Yeah, what a what a great uh, what a great reprint though. Like I said, it's a very cool card. I was actually just uh, taking apart the madness commander deck and i just pulled it out so i i've got this sitting here i'm gonna build this for sure what a cool one we're gonna leave up real quick before it curls (laughs) we're gonna go on to one of the next uh cards that a lot of people were really excited for this one's chatterfang squirrel general and a squirrel warrior from an unknown plane um i'll let john take this one away this seems like a john card it is honestly (laughs) squirrels of umbra forest have enjoyed a long peaceful existence Drakes, the neighboring Ridgeback Mountain, invaded in search of food and threatened to devour them all. Chatterfang, already a veteran of the famous Orc Fire campaign two summers before, rallied an army of fighting squirrels to drive the Drakes back and teach them a lesson they'd never forget. He personally killed over a dozen Drakes on his own and now wears their fangs as trophies and as a warning to all other would-be intruders. He killed a dozen Drakes. That's a squirrel. Yeah, that's the king of squirrels. Toss Drakes are rather large. Much. Yeah. If you saw, if you were like, hey, there was a squirrel that killed 10 owls, I'd be like, that's a pretty heavy metal squirrel. <laughs> and I did some looking because he's from an unknown plane. And I think in a strad because of Umbra Forest. Yeah. Okay. I looked up Drakes and then it led me to a list of all the Drakes on all the different planes. And I feel like you don't get metal squirrels like that outside of Innistrad. Innistrad would be the place for these like crazy vampire looking squirrels. Well, so I don't know if you heard before what I was trying to say, but do you know how Chatterfang's going to ignite his planeswalker spark? No. Okay. Because especially if he's on Innistrad, he's going to kill Emrakul. 
could you, that would be oh. canonically hilarious because that's been one of the big jokes for so long. It's like right. I swing with my flying thirteen thirteen god of destruction. I block with thirteen squirrels. I block with a chatter fang with death touch. <laughs> the death touch fang. <laughs> no. Uh, the next one we're going to go on to is Torok. Uh, so Torok was the founder and first high priest of the Order of the Ebon Hand on Sarpedia, Dominaria. Everything's Dominaria. Uh, Torok worshipped a being known as the Ebon Praetor instead of the Hand of yeah. Justice, which most people worshipped at the time. Torok established a new empire. Its capital was Architect Keep, the citadel of the Ebon Hand. Torok and his followers were necromancers able to work great magic by means of sacrifice, often of their limbs, but sometimes of human mm. lives. But Torok's greatest power lay in chants and hymns that could cause insanity in all who heard them. Upon He's a Tor- singer. Yeah. Upon Torok's death, the members of the Ebon Hand defiled him with the followers <coughs> of Leetber living in continual dread of his return. That's pretty mean. The guy's dead. Leave him alone. He just, he just gets on buildings and sings really loudly. Yeah. Just a, huh? Imagine seeing that on like a New like a New York billboard, hmm. walking down Main Street. This week, Torok <laughs> screams for forty five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Torok screams in your ears. Ugh. So the god Torok is said to have incar- uh, incarnated himself in several individuals during the ensuing centuries, including the immortal warrior Timonin uh, Longblade. The Acacian zealot mm. Oli- uh, Oliver Farrell had his followers hunt her down and kill her. Another reincarnation was said to be the neo eobonic priest Vetro. Wait, wait, wait. So if he was an immortal warrior, why, what, what, sounds, what happened with Sounds that? very mortal. Sounds, sounds more like his immortality made him sort of reincarnate himself a bunch of times, which sounds kind of like a cop-out. Huh. There uh, some of his flavor text cards that quoted or referred to are pretty good ones. Headless Spectre is no tongue to chant, yet the Forsaken hymns still emanate from its body. Yeah. That's pretty metal. The hymns melody has persisted since Torark's time, but words change to invoke the phobias of each listener. Weird. Hey, Dan, did you ever watch uh, Misfit of Demon King Academy? Yeah, no. Oh, you ever watch should. Obscure Anime number 467? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> initially bred for sacrifice the thralls eventually turned on their masters the order of the ebon hand with gruesome results sarpadian empires volume one just kind of looking like it it looked like he had his own sort of king not like a full-blooded kingdom but torark's gate kind of indicates that it was either a gate to his house or a gate to some area that he owned dude quit calling it your quit calling it by your name it's just the front door torark's canticle the same Enter hymns Torok sang. The same hymns Torok sang to praise the Ebon Praetor would later be adapted to glorify Torok himself. All right, Torok's laboratory. You think you think he's the one that adapted him for himself and just kind of spread it around like other people were singing it? Yeah, he's like, hey guys, <laughs> I changed changed the lyrics a little bit. You're not going to believe this, but it flows really well. It's like they're just that's your name. And he's like, yeah, well, yeah, it is what hey, it is. So right? good, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. I think Torok is a pretty cool character. I like this bedsheet look he has, but I definitely didn't know that their sacrifice was like, hey, we're just going to rip some of our own limbs off. To They were really out there proving, proving what they wanted to prove. So it was pre-mending Dominaria days, dude. It was just heavy metal and brutality. Like I said, a whole lot of him just screaming. That should be the intro. It's just, it's just John screaming as loud as he can. <laughs> Welcome to the Torok episode. <laughs> it's just feedback from a trash can. <laughs> uh, I'll let Evan jump on to uh, Caldro as the next one we're talking about, because we have Caldro Complete. Yes, Caldro Complete is the new card in Modern Horizons 2, and that is based on the original cards from Caldra, which were the Helm, Shield, and Sword of Caldra during the good old Dark Steel and Mirrodin eras. Um, Cauldra was a gigantic Mirren avatar composed of blue-white plasma that was summoned by Glissa, the good old Sunseeker, after she had collected the three so, uh, so-called Cauldra artifacts. Uh, the Cauldra champion helped Glissa fight uh, Memnarch's constructs until Memnarch had taken control of it, because he, art, artifacts, it, it, they're three artifacts put together. Um, it was destroyed when the green sun shot through the radix. 
In New Phyrexia, the Cauldra artifacts fell under control of the Phyrexians and were integrated into their living weapons project. Horrifying. Uh, Glissa was able to restore them and grow a specialized germ creature in the flesh vats beneath the surface. Uh, Phyrexia's newest champion will either grow strong enough to rival the original Cauldra champion in power, or it will be defeated by someone stronger uh, who will claim the artifacts. Glissa is content that either way, Phyrexia will prevail and improve. So it looks like we... Uh... Cauldra complete as the Phyrexian weapon. Whoops. Yeah. Uh -oh. So, like, if you just need a shield, a sword, and a helmet, like, where's the rest of it? Probably on Elish Norn uh -oh. soon, to be honest. Hey. Yeah, that is a cool-looking card, though. Living weapon, indestructible for seven mana. Uh, equip creature gets 5-5, five, five, has first strike, trample, indestructible, haste, and whenever it deals combat damage to a creature, exile that creature. Four, equip seven. So the, um, for the win. Right? I, lo I love the art on that card, though. Uh, what's his face? Vincent Price did a phenomenal job. It is uh, really good art. The, uh, the original cards, uh, Helm of Cauldra, was a three-mana legendary artifact that gave equipped creature first strike, trample, and haste. And then on that one, you could pay one, and if you control Helm, a Sword, and Shield of Cauldra, put a 4-4 colorless Avatar Legend creature token named Cauldra into play and attach those equipment to it. So that was the OG. Now, the Shield of Cauldra uh, gave all the other uh, artifacts indestructible, the Sword and the Helm, and then they gave the equipped creature indestructible as well for 4 mana and equipped cost of 4. That's really, really strong. That is really strong. So equipment Especially name, Sword, Shield, and Helm. Struggle. I've actually never seen anyone play the Cauldra cards. My uh, my girlfriend has them in her Kalia deck. Very cool. I really it's kind of like a it seems funny. really fun. Again, another thing. I really do think I, I understand how strong that Cauldra complete as the first strike exile damage one is pretty pretty hard to get around. But I still think people should build colorless cards with it as a commander because I think it's cool. Yes, and oh, uh, it's you you can't play Cauldra Complete as a as a commander, right? Because it's just an artifact equipment, even though it's living weapon. You can't, but I think you should. That 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 Bil should be legal. Yeah, build it and tell your play group too bad. I'm playing artifacts. Get over it. <laughs> Mono brown. Yeah, exactly. Oh um, no, my waist deck. Get over it. Grow up. <laughs> Let me have my five five first strike trample haste exile your cards creature monster. Get over it. And the 5-5 uh, five, five, uh, Exile creature that comes from the Sword of Cauldra, which was another 4-mana equipped for, with the uh, equipping creature getting plus 5, plus 5, and then whenever it deals damage, remove that creature from the game, just like the complete one says. A very, very <laughs> cool cycle to get going. Like I said, I think people should play it. I wouldn't have yeah. a problem if somebody wants to make a colorless deck that is helmed by a 7-mana commander. <laughs> that has living right. weapon and indestructible. It's it is pretty strong. I'm gonna I'll be the first one to admit it. But I still think it'd be cool. No, but um the last one is Titania. Yeah. And the, she was a Maro sorcerer. The new artwork it, for Titania, I have to say, is beautiful. And I have not seen one in like eleven boxes. I want that new art boxes, so Dave. badly. Yeah, I have a problem. And the problem is I want that Titania. So I felt about Urza. Could have just could have just bought titania i tried no one cracked it my game stores didn't crack it none of them here have seen it i don't know if the card exists what do you see player the order or the alternate one oh there's ecg player Dan. have you not seen the alternate what? one evan no sir go look at the I alternate one and you'll see why i've been cracking boxes that is what i am looking for right oh it's amazing amazing artwork that is really iris Ka, I can't read it because it's blurry, but Iris, Iris C, you did a really good job there. Oh, it, it's phenomenal artwork. Like it's sometimes I build commanders like I'm going to build Chainer because the theme is really cool. And I like that backstory that we just went over. But like that Titania is getting built on artwork alone. I don't I wouldn't even care what the card did. I'm like, all right, this is a cool card. Let's go. You have to run Wall of Blossoms in that deck as well. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, if you want to talk about the best artwork in the set, go look up Planes number number 481 for MH2. It is phenomenal. Planes 481. I'm assuming it's good because that's pretty specific if it's not. That is good art. I'll give you that. <laughs> that is I pretty that solid so artwork. Yeah. That in foil would actually Peterson, be really nice. Yeah. There has been some amazing artwork in, in Magic in the last few sets. Like I, That's how Wizards is getting me. It's not even, not even power creep on cards. It's just the pure beauty of some of them. 
but yeah, back. Sorry, I could talk about how nice the new Titania looks all day. Um, please read who she is and what she does. So she was a Mar sorcerer for the lush forest of Argoth, which was attacked by both sides for supplies at the end of the Brothers' War, Urza and Mishra. By some, she was considered to be a goddess. She was weakened due to the excessive plundering of the forest by the brothers' armies. She tried to negotiate with both brothers, but they wouldn't leave. She then led a permanent offensive against both armies, leading to the extinction of most life forms in Argoth. She eventually perished after Urza activated the Gothian Silex during his final battle with Mishra. <laughs> so, pretty depressing existence. Yeah. The nature spiral quote is pretty sad. As Argoth's last defenders fell to Urza's juggernauts, Titania said, nature cannot be destroyed, only changed. I mean, <laughs> I, think it, I think it was getting destroyed at that moment. <laughs> Man, I, have, uh, I really want to run Titania's song in, in a deck for something, just because it feels like it'd be fun to use. Yeah, like Dark good, Titania's song is fun to use. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what that card does, Titania Protector of Argoth is three double green for a 5-3 elemental. When it enters the battlefield, return target land from your graveyard to the battlefield, so already a good mechanic. But whenever a land you control is put into a graveyard from the play, create a 5-3 elemental creature token. So this one cares more about cards going to the grave, like a scape shift kind of play, fetch land kind of play thing. I, I really, really like the new artwork, so I'm going to build like a weird elemental theme land folly deck. Going directly interesting interesting card. card that is also featured in the set is you can just pay zero to sacrifice a land and gain like two or three life. Yeah, Zuranorb, love that card. Oh, Zuranorb's in, in Modern Horizons too? Oh, yeah. and Kyrian Rangers. I pulled a foil Kyrian yes. Rangers in my first pack and I was like, what is this? What are we talking I about? Pulled a, I pulled a foil black and white special border uh, Phantasmal Dreadma. Nice. The, uh, the, and a couple of boxes. The sketches, the, by the way, these boxes have been wonderful. The sketch cards were really, really cool as... Uh, as you know, if you're listening to the lore stuff, we really like the backstory of it, right? And the sketch cards are just a little bit of a backstory into the art direction that was given. And I found them really, really interesting to see. I love the sketch style design, especially for the deck and Blackblade one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, um, that's, that's kind of just the end of where we are. I, I just wanted to touch on some of these other creatures. We, we thought they were really interesting. And a lot of these stories are pretty hard to get into unless you're going deep like multiple episodes we we've got a few creatures to go over soon and they're definitely I not mean, an hour long an conversation honorable mention yeah that we can do go on um guess the hunger tide oh grist yeah yeah grist sorry he's just a uh, collection of bugs that somehow formed a spark yeah the grist is an insect or a group of insects it's just a big hive mind which is kind of scary because if you think about it, imagine if they gained a collective spark. Imagine if Slivers, another hive mind, gained a spark. I really do hope that they have a Sliver Planeswalker at some point. Me too. Oh, I hope it can be a commander. They, with their uh, their test cards, the Slivdrazi monstrosity thing, <sighs> it does show that they are kind of, they have thought of the idea of Slivers fighting the Eldrazi, and that would be a, uh, it's the same thing, trying to go against... Slivers basically have only died to natural disasters. I don't think they've ever really been beat. Yeah. Are the Eldrazi a natural disaster? No, but I I'm, would consider them an unnatural disaster. But that's what I'm saying, right? Like, the the Slivers are like a pretty aggressive swarm, right? And I don't quite know... They really pump each other up. Yeah. It, that's kind of hard to determine who would overconsume who well that because and the, when, if the phyrexians tried to to complete the uh the slivers that would be cool i a completed I, Slivdrazi. Yeah. oh my gosh i am um, i think that there's a lot of good ways to go in it they have killed off so many of these interesting characters so it's fun to see them kind of making the new ones but i really like these throwback sets that just bring us such interesting stories of the older cards like, I mean, um, to be honest, they probably have like another like two Modern Horizon sets worth of Dominaria. Oh, Dominaria just is a huge plane. We really should just do a whole episode on Dominaria, where it is, what oh, it is. Geez. Like where it is now and like where it started. Because like, it has physically it all. moved. It has physically moved in the multiverse. Really? 
Yes. It used to be the center. Oh, but now it's not, so their multiverse is expanding. I don't think it's the center anymore. But the ye old uh, methodology of thinking where everyone thought the Earth was in the center. Well, I mean, back then they didn't have people that could fly into space and know. (laughs) This is uh, pretty interesting, too. I'm just back on the Grist page. I, I do like the main persona of Grist zoomed up. Is that like little insect in it? It looks like a huge body, but it's just an insect. That's pretty cool. Um, but Grist has a song and then two notes. So the song of Grist is the hunger tide sweeps across the land, calling us forth from slumber. A great noise shall rise from the earth as many mouths cry out for sustenance. Countless wings will darken the skies and famine's teeth shall strip the flesh from the bones of the world. Let all this and more come to pass that our children may partake of this endless feast. Hey, I heard that on the radio the other day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not a great rhyme scheme, but terrifying. I think um, it's more of a uh, more of a statement. Yeah, definitely so, Golgari. Yeah, so Grist is the first non-humanoid planeswalker to be featured on a black bordered card, which to me seems weird because Ashiok isn't really humanoid, I guess. But he's humanoid. Uh huh. And then since Grist is yeah, more human than since Grist. Grist is a creature outside of the battlefield, she can be your commander in the command zone. Woo! The artwork for Grist is just phenomenal. I like. Honestly. I honestly like the original art better than the alternate art. Yeah, I I, that's why. the one I pulled. The original Grist, the red and white dress with the giant skull. That's yeah, the alternate, I, like I think. That. Right? No, the alternate's the like uh, Frexian alien looking thing. Oh, that's the one yeah, I pulled. I pulled the Frexian alien. Like Elish Norn. Wait, wait, which uh, which is which? The red and white. The alternate the is the Elish and... Norn looking thing, right? The alternate's yeah. the full art one. Yeah, I pulled the the one that looks like the death zombie. Oh yeah, that's yeah. the normal. That's the normal one. That's the one I like. Yeah, that's a cool one. Uh, we actually, for anyone who's listening to this, this one will be out Wednesday. We did uh, grist this weekend. The last podcast episode will be grist, and we did a relentless rats deck based on it, and it oh, actually my. turned out pretty did fun. Did you uh, did you add a? Uh... Did you add that insect with dredge? Uh, I didn't. This was Zach's deck. We just went through it, but I do oh. like the dredge one more. This is, uh, I, I, I named the deck. Uh, I, I kept bugging Zach the whole episode and we finally changed the deck name to, bugging. uh, yeah, these rats, bu- these rats are bugging me. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's, uh, something like that. I can't remember. I'm going to have to re-listen to it. Cause I said it a hundred times in the episode, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's basically all I wanted to cover today. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'm going to, uh, Evan, do you want to let them know where they can find stuff? Uh, um, where can <laughs> we find stuff, Dan? I'll let everyone know. Um, thank the podcast you. is available anywhere. You can listen to podcasts. Basically, if you're listening, you probably know that already. It's on Spotify and Apple. Uh, you can really support us by just leaving reviews, sharing the content, or even just checking out our YouTube stuff. You can find all of our content on www.intothe99.com. We have multiple shows, multiple great personalities. Check us out on the uh, Instagram is the where I'm the most active and most of the group is. But you can come chat with us about decks on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, we have a great Discord. Everyone's always willing to Very chat magic. Cool. Yeah. So anywhere you guys like to see it, thank you so much for listening. We appreciate it so much. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for stopping in and have a great day. See you. Bye, guys.